nice to meet you, Hamad. And um, let me just explain to our listeners, you know, what we're going to talk about today. And and it's we actually have quite a few interesting topics because Hamad is already uh, working right now on his second startup. And the cool thing is that he was able to raise money for both of the startups. And we'll talk about, you know, a little bit about the startups and how exactly, you know, he was able to raise money because that's an interesting topic for many founders. And he's also a PM, product manager. And we'll also talk some of the biggest mistakes that devs make when they're, you know, doing some project management because many devs and many founders in general are bad at project management. So Hamed will just go over that and will also, you know, probably give some advice and nice tips on how to manage your projects uh, better. Is that correct? Is that a good introduction? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, very excited to be here. So let's start, I guess, with the first topic. Uh, I know you're currently working on, um, you know, startup and um, you said it's in cybersecurity. And you, you cannot uh, tell more about it right now. But um, I, was, I, I remember you told me that, you know, you uh, raised money for it. And I was wondering, you know, how did that happen? Like, what, what was the process and so on? So that, you know, people who are listening, you know, they maybe uh, also, you know, do something similar. Absolutely. Well, thank you for asking. Uh, it's an interesting one. And I know, I, I mean, I'm still in the process of raising funds for it, uh, actually. And it is in a very, very early stage idea. So I wouldn't say that it's actually a startup or it's something mm -hmm. that is very concrete yet. Uh, what I have raised or have achieved is that through my network that I have from my previous startup, I reached out back to them and we have been already been in touch over the last three, four years that we know each other and reached back to them and said, hey, uh, I'm thinking about such an idea. I, it had this traction. We have advisors from these companies. I have some uh, LOIs, letter of interest. Uh, from uh, or letter of intent from companies uh, that who are customers for it uh, are you interested in it or like what should i do for next step and uh, it's actually people by themselves they said oh this sounds interesting i like, what is your challenge i said like my challenge is like raising funds right now and it it's a investment heavy startup I said, okay like i can invest in you like an angel invest with you if there are other investors to, uh, to some extent. So that, that was the process. Uh, I'm not sure it's a recipe that everyone can uh, repeat basically, or even myself. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, random or, opportunity. Uh, experimental. Exactly. But, and, but what I can recommend is like reaching out to people and basically going after opportunities. Like that is the higher mm -hmm. level. Uh, mm -hmm. Like maybe this friend wouldn't have said that, but still yeah. I I am connecting with other people in meetings, events mm -hmm. that I, I, I see, friends of friends, asking the super connectors in network. Those are really good uh, and important assets. So whichever city you are, whichever uh, country you are, there are some people that who are in the startup scene or investment scene mm -hmm. that know many people. Like talk to them and uh, pitch your idea about that. So that's... Uh, long story short, mm. how I managed to get okay, the that's first. Actually, that sounds pretty simple if you know the right people. So basically, this was just investor who you knew uh, before from your previous networking events. And you just emailed that person and told uh, that person about your project. And uh, the person was interested in investing, right? So it, uh, all it says... To some extent, yes, I'm, I'm uh, connecting those people as well. Uh, this person specifically was advisor in my previous startup. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have been working for some time together as an advisor and we had like uh, weekly cadences and okay. so on. So, mm -hmm. so we, he we know also each other probably pretty believed well. in you. So that exactly, definitely. also probably be believed in you. That, that's also a big, uh, a big, a big uh, reason, I think, because, you know. 100%. Exactly, and, uh, like especially in, er yeah, it's okay. Uh, especially yeah. in early stage of the startup, okay, okay. especially in the early stage of the startup, the the trust is uh, not only from uh, angel investors and advisor, but even like if you are raising a VC round, is the most important thing uh, that hmm. investors will look into. Uh, there is nothing else basically; it's just the idea. Maybe you have a prototype, but 
it's in the end comes back to trust and belief that okay you will be building a company that when it's yeah. uh, exiting i will earn money on top wow that's actually interesting because you don't have a product yet it's just an idea phase and they will still you know interest they will still willing to invest because they know you personally and they trust you personally so i think that's probably a very important factor obviously the trust the fact that they trust you and obviously exactly. you build that trust with your previous uh, startup and uh, so uh, can you tell me a little bit about that yeah absolutely the startup was uh, i started just after uh, my i finished my university in in kth i did masters in data science and i started it based on the idea that i got in my master thesis when i was working in the bank mm -hmm. so the startup was providing environmental, social, and governance data, ESG data, to fund managers and institutional investors, a very hot topic uh, in the investment world and with the climate change and green movement overall. So we were providing this from uh, public data and by scraping different websites and uh, following company news. Uh, so that was the idea of the startup. We worked on it for uh, around two years. And uh, we had lots of uh, both achievements and mistakes. It is given that I was uh, 22, 23 years old, uh, just after school and not so much uh, work experience other than internships. So I did quite a lot of mistakes there. And in the end, when we were raising our, we had the angel investment or seed round. And when we were raising our series A, it uh, combined with uh, Corona time in 2020. So our pilot projects all stalled and we couldn't continue. So that was the that was a short story of of the startup uh, so called Finna. It was basically you were trying to predict some like financial information based on the news. Or not uh, financial information, but actually non-financial information. So information about the environmental uh, performance of the company, how much. Uh, CO2 emissions mm -hmm. they produce, what is their social structure, like the like male to female ratio in their board or their governance, uh, what is the uh, governance structure in the company. So this becomes more and more uh, important nowadays in investment. Most of the funds and uh, pension funds have goals about having a green portfolio and mm. um, making sustainable and responsible investments. And for that, they need a lot of data. And most of the time, the data uh, they are getting from other providers, they are um, uh, manually created. And so makes them very old uh, because you can't like update the company. Like there are hundreds of thousands of companies in the world. Um, versus ours was through machine learning. So we were providing this uh, almost in real time. Mm -hmm. OK. Oh, it was. Through machine learning. Exactly. Wow. So we were scraping the data uh, about the companies and extracting this information. So you kind of had to build like a AI uh, that understands, you know, what's happening. And, uh, you know, based on that kind of data, well, that's, that's actually pretty cool. And um, were you building the AI yourself or like what, what uh, or someone else was, you know, mainly working on that? So who was who was doing the machine learning part? Uh, I was the one who was working on the machine learning part uh, be, okay, because of my studies. What, what did you use to? Did you use like a, I know TensorFlow JS? They uh, mm -hmm. they have like some machine learning uh, framework. Did you use something else or did you use that? Uh, yeah, we use completely different things. So uh, we didn't do that much with deep learning, uh, but mainly with uh, name entity recognition. Uh, so a lot of uh, text, we had basically just text data. And uh, mm -hmm. we did training on the data sets that we had. Like for example, uh, CO2 emission is mentioned in this part, in, in this, like these are the words behind it and after it. So uh, more of uh, NLP, natural language processing, we were uh, using in, mm -hmm. in yeah, machine learning models. Mm -hmm. OK, that's actually uh, very interesting. And uh, was it written with, uh, on Python, JavaScript? Because I know Python is used a lot with uh, machine learning. So what exactly. language did you use? Pa Python? Yeah, we were using Python. Well. Yeah. 
Okay, that that's pretty cool because I have been interested in machine learning uh, lately as mm-hmm. myself. So, but I don't know Python. I mainly mm-hmm. use JavaScript, and I found like yeah. TensorFlow. That like they also like a framework for for that as well. Uh, but you said you were also doing scraping, and I'm just curious, what was more complicated, the scraping part or the machine learning part? And what was also more, what is it, what was the word? Because I know uh, machine learning takes a lot of power from the like uh, server, and scraping also, I think, takes a lot of power. So what, what was heavier? I think it's actually kind of a general rule in almost every data science project or machine learning project, the data collection and labeling was like 90, 95% of the effort. Uh, because after that, if you have clean data, it's quite straightforward. And that's what we learned in the school. But regarding the data collection, uh, which is partly a scraping, so I wouldn't say it was so scraping was a very small percentage of our uh, data sources. We were also connected to 32,000 news sources and like other financial information providers that we were using as our uh, data sources. So, uh, but still like having a good search and filter on them, finding the right information um, and labeling them, it was the majority of the effort after that. If mm-hmm. that is correct, then everything else is good. If we were not getting the right results, uh, most of the time we had to change our labeling uh, structure and methodology. Mm. So you said that you were connected to many news agencies, but who is who was extracting data from? You said that if not scraping, were you doing it like manually, labeling, taking data, or it was automated, that process? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. So like you said that uh, you were not doing, you were doing not only scraping, but like, uh, but, and you were also connected to like many news agencies, like many news outlets. Exactly. Uh, but how you were getting information from there, were you just taking it manually and labeling it manually or was it all manual work or? No, no so of course not all should be manual work, but uh, as a source, we were using them. Then uh, they had APIs. So we were using the APIs for uh, collecting them. And we, of course, uh, like any other machine learning projects, so we were labeling 10 to 100 articles or news about the company that are uh, related to their environmental, social, or governance aspect and extract the information. For example, if uh, their board members has changed and there is a new, like, uh, a new board member or uh, they shut down a factory or things that happened in the company that impacts okay. their... Um, ESG, then we were extracting and we were labeling it and we were using that labeling in the other, the mm-hmm. few hundred thousand other articles mm-hmm. that we haven't read it man. So what what was the plan with uh, Finna? Like, how were you planning to make money? Yes. So this data source is actually quite expensive, even nowadays. Um, there are several companies that are have similar uh, idea and uh, how they work uh, like Finna at the moment. And investors pay a lot of money for data sources to make their investments, especially Mm -hmm. for sustainable and responsible investments, which there are many regulations, both in Europe and US, that the funds have to make green investments or reduce the carbon emission of their portfolio. So it's uh, they have huge penalties for that. Uh, and this is a data source data that it's not easily accessible and not so many providers out there. So direct like subscription, um, direct sales and subscription basically was the uh, monetization method. Uh, sales to the invest, uh, for the investors. Exactly. The institutional okay, I, investors, uh, not the uh, private that. investor. Yeah. Okay. So they have to, uh, there are specific standard num- standards that they have to, you know, ab- obey, I guess, obey, like uh, some... Exactly. Okay, that's that's pretty cool. I didn't actually know that. Hmm. That, that's that's more interesting. So, and, and I, I mean, what makes this actually even more interesting is that, you know, as a startup, obviously you need investors. And then the thing is that you also are selling your product to the investors as well. So that's, that's an interesting mm-hmm. uh, c- cycle, I would say. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, I would say we were just selling it to different type of investors. So uh, like, for example, our investors would be VC, like venture capitalists. 
uh, and we were selling it to like fund managers and pension funds and uh, like a very different category of investor that can't invest in us. Um, so mm. it was, yeah. But uh, it overall, was it was, yeah, definitely interesting. Like uh, mm. we were both in the same side kind of investment. Okay. And uh, what happened? Like, I mean, uh, but I, as far as I know, it shut down. And what was the main reason, you know, for it to, for, for shutting down? Yeah. So what we did is we developed a product and we pitched it to uh, fund managers in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. And we got several interested uh, companies for it uh, who were interested to tr taking it to a trial and pilot. Uh, that pilot was, was starting 2020 in January uh, for three months. Mm -hmm. And given the Corona, what happened in Corona time, and especially for investment investors, it was a huge shock. Like no one knew what's going to happen and like the yeah. market crashed and all of that. So, uh, all those pilots, uh, been suspended and, mm -hmm. uh, investors basically got much more other things to do. Like then the green investment was not the thing. Like there is a, a huge a pandemic is going in the world, like green investment and like yeah. things. No one knew what to do. So, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we didn't get the pilots done and both investment, like even startup investment also been reduced, like no one knew what gonna, what's going to happen. So the investors that we had waiting for our pilot project to finish, they also like, we didn't have a pilot uh, anymore. And yeah, everyone is in a shock. So we couldn't raise funds. And yeah, we decided to shut down and we were running out of cash. So, Wow. So Corona affected you uh, a lot, right? I mean, Corona yeah. killed your company, basically. <laughs> that, to some extent, yeah. That's yeah. crazy. Uh, that's, uh, I mean, one way, uh, like, uh, even that can be true, but I don't see it like that because I think we could have done it faster, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. To not be in that state. So if we had our pilot mm. project from October to December, that wouldn't be a problem. So yes, in hindsight, it kind of killed it. But if we were doing it differently or had more experience, it wouldn't have mm. happened. So I'm not sure if it's Corona's fault or my, myself. Well, I mean, yeah, obviously, you know, like no startup is executed perfectly. There are also like things that go, come from inside the startup, but also many outside factors. I remember with my first big startup, uh, Food Look, uh, it was main. It was mainly like in uh, Azerbaijan, and we were like the idea was that well, we were selling a subscription to restaurants, and we also were kill, killed. We also died, I would say, because of outside mm -hmm. factors. Uh, I don't know okay. if you remember that, but there was a. The, a night in Azerbaijan where the currency crashed twice. I think it went exactly. like, I like, uh, Azerbaijan manat was more expensive than the dollar. And then in one night it went like twice cheaper and then it was cheaper than dollar. Exactly. And when that happens, all of the companies that we were planning to sell to told us that they don't want to spend any money. They don't know what's going to happen in the future. And, uh, exactly. we also died because of that. So I, I do understand, I do understand how you feel basically. So yeah, yeah exactly. that's <laughs> that's horrible. Yeah. But uh, you know, once the corona ended, were you thinking of you know bringing Finna back, like uh, trying to uh, sell again and try again with a tri trial period? Uh, yes and no uh, to some extent, for several different reasons. I would say it was, it is kind of still like in my part of my myself and I learned a lot about sustainable investments but the whole experience and after I joined uh, other companies as product managers uh, I saw how much I don't know so even mm. though I liked or I wish that I could take Finna back but I know I, I got to understand that I actually like can learn a lot by working so mm. that's what I've been basically doing for the last two years and and I never felt completely ready to start a new company because I think there's still a lot to be learned and found, founding a company and being a CEO is actually a very hard job. Something that I was naive enough just after the school, uh, I didn't mm -hmm. know, uh, like naively. So 
now that's why even for this startup like i am doing it quite um cautiously and to see okay like let's see everything is in place if i'm ready if we can really make it happen and then take it next steps um because it's really hard work required and it's it's a 24 7 hour job uh it should be mentally even physically everything be ready to go there so since none of that happened going back to i wished but i never did something to do it because i just knew that it takes too much work and i can learn much more by working in some other company than just by bringing a startup up again yeah i do totally agree with you that you know uh being a ceo of a company of a startup is actually very hard it's not like you know like we see it in the movies or in the stories and so on it's a completely yeah. different thing and i don't know this also probably probably happened to you as well but i remember when i was like uh 20 2021 uh, 20, and i was also running uh, my first startup you know before i started running it i was also thinking that you know through i was also looking at it through pink glasses you know everything was like yeah, i was thinking of it differently but now that i'm older i see it completely different that's it's actually it's it is it's kind of fun but also not fun at the same time so it's like uh yeah sometimes you wonder exactly. should you should you even do it you know <laughs> exactly yeah yeah so and you said that you transitioned uh 2 p.m uh like to being a product manager so my question is what do you actually enjoy more do you enjoy more you know coding and actually creating the product or do you enjoy more like managing the creation of the product mm, good question i find joy in both of them actually uh even when i'm doing product management i do still like do for example a lot of data gathering and uh, sql and creating different dashboards and even coding on my side projects so i try to keep it mixed and that was one of the reason I like product manager, like product management is really like a good fit for me. I feel like it because I have very different uh, interests uh, where you can combine it in product management from talking design business to marketing and uh, engineers, all of them are there. So even I might not be coding, but I'm talking very technical uh, topics with the engineers. So that's kind of uh, something. And I think if I look at overall, what are the important skills, I would say I would weigh product management a little bit higher than uh, coding um, for myself. For, like and it depends on the stage and which point of view you are looking at it. But just coding by itself, uh, of course, it's what makes a product. Like you need engineers and mm -hmm. that's the actual driving force. But Product management is more like where you are going. If you are not going the correct way, then it doesn't matter how fast you are going or how slow you are going. So I like product management because it, if done correctly, then you can solve the problems with the right products in the right way and reach the end customer. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, actually very hard skill. Like there is no, you don't learn it in university or something. It is very different per company and per sector. I might be the, the very good PM in fintech for B two C, but I will be. I have absolutely no idea in a product manager for a medtech company or in a game gaming company. Like they are completely different. So PM overall is very vague by itself. Versus coding, uh, it's really good. Uh, it is the driving factor, but it needs to have these elements uh, beside it to make it um, make it useful. So to summarize, I, I would love to learn, uh, be comfortable with product management and then do coding in line with the product ideas I have mm. or the business opportunities mm. I see rather than just coding by myself. That, uh, that is not as interesting anymore. Okay, yeah, I, I do understand what you mean. Um, especially because, for example, right now on Twitter, um, I'm inside the community of indie makers, many solopreneurs, mm -hmm. people who uh, are building things. And most of them are coders first. And they code many projects, but they never reach, you know, any stage with the project. They code it and then they leave it and they do, they do something else. 
or they don't have any plans for it or they don't market it. And uh, I see what you're saying is that, you know, if you know product management, then you can actually uh, take a, the project and you can bring it somewhere, like you can make something out of it. But if you just code, uh, it's not going to bring the project anywhere if you don't do anything other than just, you know, coding the product, obviously. So, exactly. and with that said, my question is, what do you think is the biggest mistakes that devs make regarding product management, for example? Yeah. I would say I would make it even more generally, not maybe devs or like any company or even like product managers themselves and maybe myself as well from time to time. It's forgetting about the who is their real customer and what is their pain point. It's very common uh, that we, we go start from an idea and we don't know exactly who is our customer or we have some idea who is our customer. Uh, that we're going to pay for our product or use our product, but we don't verify it, validate our hypothesis. So and that is a very a dangerous mistake. We we have an idea for some people. Let's say we have an idea that uh, moms that who wants to take their kids to school have this problem. Awesome. That might be very true and like a very big business. But that means that I need to talk with those people and validate my idea and make sure that the problem exists. Uh, it's big enough for them. My solution actually solves it. It's the best solution out there. Like maybe they can solve it in a different way. And I have a way to reach to them. And with the last part is most of the time is also overlooked, the marketing and mm -hmm. uh, sales part to it. So, and all of them, are, I would say, is kind of starts from one thing, like from understanding the user and the problem, starting from the problem, not from the solution. Uh, we as engineers and even myself, like I would say I'm more engineer than PM, uh, both from like uh, historically a background. So I'm most of the time intrigued or excited about technology or ideas and uh, solutions. And I forget about the problem side. So it, it's a very common, uh, basic things happen even in companies, um, become very excited about one mm. solution, but we forget what is the problem and who are they that mm. we are solving it for. Okay. So from what you said, I can actually, you know, agree with that from my personal experience as well, because, you know, Sometimes you just get an idea or you just think of a really cool future and you just start burning aside because you want to do it. You know, you want to create it, you want to code it and so on. Exactly. But you don't really think, you know, do actually people need this? You know, like who is my target market? It's just, you just want to do it. And it's very hard to, you know, stop and to be like, okay, I actually have to think, you know, is this actually valuable? Like, is this a good use of my time? Is someone going to use this or not? And most, many people yeah. don't do this. They just create something and they run with it. And uh, the problem is that, for example, we, we, there are many examples of people who did that and who actually got successful. But I think that's a very small number. Most people who do that, they fail, uh, but we don't know about them. So I would say probably out Absolutely. of 100 people like who would do that without any plan, without thinking who is the customer and so on, probably five would succeed and then 95 would fail. So exactly. yeah, it's probably best to still plan ahead. Exactly. Yeah, I, I would add something. So it's not by no means that like you shouldn't like do anything. Of course, like the idea rush, that is like probably it's best to not do it as soon as possible. Uh, but if something is super small and like testing it is doesn't cost that much, then yeah, you can code it, of course. Uh, so there is like a lot of practicalities that you can apply. There might be an idea that uh, it's much easier to do it and show it than go and talk to these moms and everything. Uh, there are also other types that you, you can, you have validations indirectly. Like even though you didn't talk with this type of Twitter groups, but or users, but you see that everyone in Twitter is doing this. For example, let's say if people are screenshotting their Twitter and sending it in LinkedIn, 
then you might have, oh, like I can make it that you just paste the link and it creates a nice Twitter uh, image. So sometimes you don't need to talk about it. Like some things are indirect valid validation or implicit validation. Then it's uh, quite easy to go with, especially the solution is quite easy. But when it comes, if you want to actually start a business out of it, uh, charge some money for it, and uh, you don't know exactly who you are selling or how you're going to get them, then it's hard. With this example, uh, you know that you saw 40, 50 of them. You can do a LinkedIn search and like just mm -hmm. direct message them or comment them. Like There is a way to reach them. So there, probably, I would also just build a product and like comment, hey, by the way, you could also do with this. What do you think? Or like, yeah, do all of this hustling. But if something is is very distant and I have no idea who is the customer or what do they actually feel, then I would I would first suggest talking to them and gathering some insights. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, some of the examples that you gave right now is uh, something like uh, validating the product before MVP. So something similar to that. Do you think there are like um, some really good ways to validate the product before MVP? Like, for example, trying to like, to, for example, I've always thought, you know, what if you would just build a landing page? and try to do a pre-sell of the product. So basically to validate it and then build the product. So have you thought absolutely. of that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's uh, one of the common ways and like most uh, recommended ways. That works for a specific type of uh, products, uh, especially mm -hmm. like if it's B2C or like general products. Regarding the validation, I would say, one should validate the problem first, maybe before MVP, because mm. that is the hardest part. Like product is the second step. Like you should know that that is what we are solving is actually a problem. And mm. so I would first focus on validating the problem and what are the current ways that is being solved? Because I mean, we are humans. Like, if we have a problem we've, and it's big enough, you will try to solve it. You will not just sit there and say, yeah, I have that problem. Uh, let's be there. You will do something about it. So it's not that the solution doesn't exist. Uh, you just do it different. Let's say scooter companies. They are problem, uh, solving the problem of last mile um, communication uh, commute. And what people do, they walk or they take the bus like take a taxi different things so those are becomes your alternative solution and for any other product let's say as mentioned the twitter or any other uh, app you go or let's say habit tracking for example people are doing it in their notebooks physically or in excel there is some way people are already doing them it's not that it's non-existent so validating the problem and the current solutions that are available will be very helpful because you might find that during this validation that these people actually, for example, don't have any iPhone. Then you doing MVP in iPhone or having a landing page that download this from App Store doesn't help. So it's very, it increases the chance much higher. There is, of course, as I said, uh, cases that all of this like matches uh, either serendipitously or you just know it because of your network and experience that you know that the problem exists, you know how to get to them, uh, you you have good insight on the user, you create a landing page, you get lots of waiting lists and you go. Uh, mm -hmm. But that is great, like then go, just go for it. But if you don't have all these insights, investing some time to get them would make it make any side project much more successful and increases its chance of success. Okay. Yeah, I do um, agree with you. So basically in short, spend some time to do some research first before you jump into the project. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, actually being, um, for example, my main profession, you know, my main strength is actually UXUI design. And I have been teaching UXUI in the last three years, you know, to many students. I've been mentoring them and so on. And one of the biggest problems that, uh, one of the biggest mistakes that designers do is that when they start designing, 
they just want to start designing, you know, the pictures and everything like with the colors. They just, they just, they just want to start designing. They don't do research before they design. And uh, that's why, you know, then, you know, the design may look good, but the usability is really bad because there was no research because people don't like doing research. You know, research is something yeah. that most people find boring, I would say. So what, what about, do you think, uh, do you find research boring or do you enjoy doing it? I would say research is actually very uh, interesting for me, uh, exciting because I'm learning new things, like things that I didn't know. Like, I, for example, I talk to you and say, oh, by the way, how do you do X? Tell me last time you mm -hmm. did it. What was hard about it? What was what you liked, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, for me, as a curious person, it's very, very interesting. I think uh, one reason that probably research is overlooked uh, or is skipped And I sometimes do it as well. Uh, so everything I say is like, it also applies to me. And now I'm saying everyone else is doing wrong. Is that it's really hard to do in a sense that finding people to, that you will get 30 minutes of time to talk to uh, that are in your audience is very hard. Uh, doing the correct research format is hard. And let's say you do all this uh just getting summarizing them and get, taking the insights out of your conversation and making decision out of that is even harder. So it's not that people don't like it, but I would say it's like some hard. Uh, it's more like going to uh, to run in 6 a.m. or like taking a cold shower. It's it is there, but it's hard. So that's why uh, it's mm -hmm. been skipped uh, in the product development mm -hmm. process most of the time. Have you ever run at 6 a.m.? Hey, run 6 a.m.? No, but I think at 7 a.m. Yes. At 7 <laughs> Okay, so yeah. one hour difference. It's at okay. Six. Yeah. Uh, I remember I started, I, I was, so I started running um, a month ago, and my plan was to run at 6 a.m. I did that for two days in a row, and then I didn't yeah. do that. <laughs> so I, exactly. I lasted only two days. So yeah. well, what about, do you, have you ever tried to do something like that? Have you ever like tried to, you know, become like a morning person, wake up early, you know, do fitness gym and then like all the mm -hmm. stuff that s sounds cool, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, to some extent. So I try to build habits that uh, helps mm -hmm. me to reach my goals. So most, more than I... Uh, I have a goal of like, let's say, having uh, X amount of followers, I break it down to a habit. So, okay, I need to like follow 10 people every week or every day and post two posts uh, every week, etc., etc. So making habits like that. When it comes to this type of habits, yes, indeed. Uh, there are several, I, I can say like what would make it uh make it good for example last like the big one of the biggest ones that i did was actually for running and when i was preparing training for marathon and then i was really much into it and like following the program because i knew that i really want to uh, run this and i really want to do it correctly mm -hmm. like i don't want to uh, leave it in the middle or something like that or take a very long time so i was always motivated so the goal was important enough for me that i was actually running uh, three four times a week like uh, various uh, distances so yes i've done it and the habit should be important enough for you to do it so in your case like i would say 6 a.m running it sounds nice good but uh, probably the reason it didn't continue it was either like very ambitious like maybe you never run before i'm not i don't know but also, like you don't know for what reason. Like it's a good in idea, but why you want to do that? Uh, if you don't, if your mind can't answer to that question, the third morning you said like bed is actually pretty nice and warm. Like I can do it later. Um, but if you know that that's six a.m. Like if uh, you are in a uh, U.S. for example, and it would make you into the SWAT army, and like that is like your goal and passion, and you want to be there, then definitely you would do it. So mm -hmm. it just depends on on the motivations. Yeah, I actually, um, I do agree.
I, my motivations were not that. I mean, my motivation was that I thought if I wake up early and run early, that I would be happier during the day. Uh, it worked mm -hmm. for the first day, but the second day I was just tired. I wasn't really that happy. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. You know, with that said, so I'm actually, you know, curious uh, because we were talking about validation and so on. What do you think about my product, uh, the BIP, uh, basically the Chrome extension? So um, do you think the, it solves a valid problem or what are your thoughts on it? I'm just curious. A good question. I actually haven't used it. I just saw the landing page yeah. and I know just what from is what it you about. Saw, yeah. yeah. I think, for example, for this one, uh, I can say you can actually run a, like a small user interview or user research for me. You found a product manager that like kind of had that problem before. So you can, um, you can make questions that actually f and helps you to find the answer for your main question. Um, that's, mm -hmm. that's why it's hard with user research. But if I want to answer for, for that problem, I think we had, uh, I had, I've been in the situation where I had like sent screenshots and, mm -hmm. and basically slacks to engineers and everyone else or other people were sending it to me. So I think it has very good potential going forward, but you, you need to be maybe a little bit more specific about what problems it solves right now. Is it sending mm -hmm. screenshots all over the place and not, knowing that were they handled or not. So if you, for example, s focus from that angle, I think everyone in my team and company would love it because people send you like, like product is big and complex. So you don't, uh, there might be some missing. So someone from marketing comes and Hey, by the way, this thing, there's a typo here, or this thing doesn't work. They mm -hmm. send out to me. But they don't know what happens to it. Either I, as a like, I have good PM skills, and I say, okay, I add it to the backlog, and when it's done, I say, hey, thanks for saying it, I've done. Yeah. But you can automate this process, making the PM really good PM, like empowering PMs, and ma making other p uh, people in the company, for example, by earning karma or like points that, oh, I mm -hmm. did five or fifty suggestions, and forty of them got implemented. So if you solve that mm -hmm. part, I would say it's a kind of different problem or selling point versus if you are sol solving a problem of PM can't communicate to pro uh, to engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, for example, I need to make like, I don't know, 50 screenshots or video and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I cannot, uh, most of the time I was doing, for example, with Loom videos, uh, especially when mm -hmm. it's uh, interaction based. So like, oh, when yeah. I click this, there is this oh, thing animation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Or when I, for example, reduce the screen size to this one, or when I refresh, there are things that are not, for example, on a static page. So I was solving it in different ways. So it's almost the same product, but because it solves different angles, one, you're empowering uh, the PMs and the, everyone else in the company to be involved in the product development. That is very, like, we'll have different feature set uh, going forward than if you are solving it for PMs to communicate more, uh, collect documentation for their feature requests or bug reports. Mm -hmm. That's a uh, different. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, I would like, yeah, my uh, motto would be yeah, like do uh, user research <laughs> with more PMs and find out yeah. what is your niche, which problem is bigger. I and mean, both mm -hmm. of them are a problem, but you are mm -hmm. looking for a problem that is easy understood. Everyone is willing to pay for it and yeah. uh, easier to develop. Yeah. So just to, you know, explain for people who uh, don't know, don't know enough about BIP, uh, it's a Chrome extension that allows you to add comments uh, on any page, anywhere on the screen and tag people. So like, for example, if you think, you know, this button should be green and not red, you just click on the button, a comment popped up, you write, you know, change this button to green and then tag the person who is supposed to change this. And, uh, you know, uh, you're right in terms of that it's not focused enough. Right now it's broad because there are a few problems in my mind that it can solve. I don't know on which problem exactly should, should I solve. 
because um, the idea is that obviously, first of all, it's replacing screenshots and video recordings. Because sometimes there are things that you don't need to do a video recording for, but you are doing this because, you know, you are used to doing this. But I feel like video recordings, first of all, it takes time to record it. And also for the other person, it takes time to watch the video, right? But if you would just leave a, left a comment on the website directly, they would just see it on the website and they would not need to watch the, uh, the, full, the whole video. So, and then screenshots, you know, screenshots are kind of uh, annoying if you get, especially if you get a lot of screenshots because I've been, you know, designing, developing sites myself and I would also often get screenshots from uh, clients and so on. Hey, change this, this is not right and blah, blah, blah. And then I would have to go to the website and find exactly where is the problem. But like this, I would just see it exactly on the website. So it does solve the problem for me. Now, another mm -hmm. problem, uh, uh, one is feedback, obviously. Another problem is also instructions. For example, you know, uh, I was, uh, I'm a UCI mentor, and I often need to, you know, send my students some kind of links. And, uh, but for example, there's a long article, and I want to tell them, hey, start reading here. And Beep actually helps me to solve that as well because I can just create a comment and be like, start reading here. Or I can send mm -hmm. them some designs and be like, hey, this design looks nice, do something similar. So it's not only nice. to report the box, but it's also to give instructions like use this color or, or, or you can go to your competitor's website and be like, hey, their tagline is really good. You tag your marketer and be like, hey, we should do something similar. So it's yeah. basically like a communication cross sites uh, uh, for the team. Or let's say you yeah. have a new employer and the employer doesn't know where to start. And you can actually do like onboarding for the employee using that. Like, for example, tag the employee and be like, okay, here you can find all of our assets. Here mm -hmm. you can find all of our analytics. You know, here you, sh you, you can see the product management. So there yeah. are many things that can be done with it, especially considering Sounds that I'm also planning to implement things like, for example, uh, integrations with Asana, Monday, and other things. Like, for example, if you want to create a ticket, like if you want to create a task when you create a comment and assign it to someone so that it can be done automatically. So I'm thinking about these things as well. I don't say having like a buttons like this was solved or, you know, replies yeah. and so on. So the main things that can be done, that's why I'm right now, I'm just trying to understand what is the best thing to do. So I'm just testing with different people. I'm just testing with everyone who wants to test it. So. <laughs> Sounds great, actually. Uh, like you, like shed a light about f other problems that I didn't know. Like the designers have uh, those problems, or uh, like now I, like I get a flashback and I, I agree with you that those problems also exist. So I would actually change my uh, suggestion since the product is already brought and you have a product ready. Uh, now it would be really good actually to test it with all these use cases that you have. Basically, onboard as many people uh, as you uh, you can to to help them test the product and help them by like providing a Notion page with all these use cases, like how they can use the product. Uh, yeah. If they don't know how they can use it, they might use it in one way, which is also interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you should have two groups, like one group you give them, one group you didn't yeah. give them, and maybe they will use it in different ways that you didn't include it. They're boxing them. And yeah, uh, sounds very interesting. Like I'm actually got even more excited about your product. Seems like a really cool idea. Really nice. Yeah, uh, th and, thank and, you. <laughs> uh, ticketing system, I would recommend Linear actually. Almost all the new startups and big companies, like the issue management system is in, or ticketing system is in Linear, if you know the company, linear.app. Okay. It's a it's a very powerful and good product. Also, recommend it for other fellow engineers so it's and like product managers. It's for talking about bags, or like it's when users tell you that there's some kind of bag, or what is it used for? No, it's a complete uh, ticket like uh, ticketing system. You can uh, you have all your backlog items there. You plan your sprints. You have you can comments under the each. Ticket basically, uh, you can connect it with your GitHub or GitLab, and tickets automatically get updated. You can define your roadmap there and make different projects, have different teams. So it's mm -hmm. one solution to manage basically what is okay. going to be built on the product side. Okay, it has really because really good I saw, features, but... mm -hmm. 
I thought most companies are using like things like Asana, I don't know, ClickUp, Monday.com, or, or is this for, for a different purpose? Yeah, exactly. Are so I like think for, I mean, you can use Asana and Monday.com as well. I never seen actually a company using Asana or Monday.com for really? product development. Uh, mm -hmm. like mainly design teams, not design, sorry, marketing, uh, some design as well are using mm -hmm. it. Uh, but when it comes to high tech uh, and complex product okay. uh, ticketing, mm -hmm. I always say linear, uh, which is, mm -hmm. yeah. Very okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So linear is more focused on uh, IT teams, on the dev teams, I would say. Okay. Exactly. So the technical products. Mm -hmm. mm, yes. And that's uh, also insight comes from maybe like I shouldn't have made that suggestion, but that insight comes from your user group. If you are targeting, yeah. for example, companies in Azerbaijan and all of them are using Asana or uh, maybe Trello, then you need to connect with them. If you are targeting the ones in Europe and like you have connection with them and there are 10 startups uh, that you can reach to and they are using eight of them linear, then maybe you can use linear. Okay, that's 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 a good suggestion. Yeah, I have never heard of that company. I will look into that. Yeah, because I was planning to integrate, you know, with different uh, things, and uh, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. One additional thing, you know, which uh, made my problem even more complicated is the fact that I kind I added hashtags to Beep, and that means that, for example, if you want to save something personally for you, you know, you're browsing the internet, you find some nice image and you think okay maybe i should use it in this app and like you can create a comment and uh like use this in the app and add a hashtag like style for example and then you can mm -hmm. uh, filter by all the hashtags so like it's also good for collecting items from anywhere on the web and just having them all in one place and using hashtags so mm -hmm. yeah i am i'm i'm too broad so i'm, I'm just like i'm trying to focus but it's difficult because there are so many problems that it can solve so exactly yeah yeah <laughs> 100%. What I would uh, suggest in these situations, uh, first, that's a, that seems also like a valid uh, problem, uh, like generally. Uh, of course, needs to be tested. And second is then you have a very different competitor set. There is like other yeah. websites that help you to save mm -hmm. assets and everything. Then you are competing mm -hmm. with that, which is completely different from onboarding customers or uh, employees. Yeah, that, that's so true. In startup development, most of the time, there is a, a kind of new framework uh, or idea basically going on. Previously, they were talking about MVP. I'm mm -hmm. more of a person that believes in this new one, which is called MVT, uh, uh, Minimum Viable mm -hmm. Tests. So mm -hmm. what you want to do in early stage of startup or have an idea is to basically, as they say in cliche, is fail fast. You have list of hypotheses. This product can be used for collecting assets across the internet for designers, for onboarding new employees, for uh, mm -hmm. making communication between PM. These are all of them are hypotheses, right? Uh, probably not all of them are true. And even if all of them mm -hmm. are true, there is one of them, like the Pareto effect, that is much bigger than all of the others. It's much easier to reach mm -hmm. there. The problem is much more painful. So you want to find that one the fastest. So you look at it as uh, there is some options and you want to find, okay, which uh, door is the best door for me to take. And for that, it's basically you can do different tests, like maybe with different landing pages uh, with different people, send it to 10 startups each version and see which one uh, you get the most feedback. Share it with mm -hmm. different people, like each one differently and say okay for designers you are already a designer you, you have a designer community send it to 50 designers and say has this been a problem i have a solution for this it costs mm. this much um see what they say uh, maybe they are not interested or the problem exists but they are solving it in a different way so yeah so focus on mvts uh, like tests uh, mvts fail uh, fast. i have never heard of that sounds interesting i will look into that more um, but sure. do you have any experience with B2B sales? Uh, yes. So Finna was B2B. So we were like the investors yeah. uh, around the business side. 
But how did you get them? Like, did you email them or what was the process? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. And I think it differs uh, dramatically based on who is your business you are targeting. If you are targeting um, a startup, which is like also business, but it's a startup, it's very different than if you are targeting uh, hospitals, like if you're medtech or investors or general like SaaS companies, for example. Mm -hmm. um, there are, of course, some like general ways to reach out to them. But for my case, since you asked about my experience was that like, first, there are not so many investors like uh, funds and pension funds in one country, like especially like uh, some place as small as Sweden. So it's the list is quite like small uh, so it comes from of course some of them we uh, cold reach basically in linkedin uh, some of them i met in events regarding sustainable and responsible investments and uh, the best ones were the ones that we got into an uh, introduction to them uh, from uh, someone that we knew that knew them and introduced us to them uh, so it works very differently like since we have like for example let's say 50 uh, potential customers then it's much easier like to find people who are connected to them if you are targeting a very big uh, industry let's say all SaaS companies or uh, startups mm -hmm. in one company then that wouldn't work um, i mean it can work to some extent but you need to find like cold reach or more uh, scalable yeah. options mm -hmm. The reason why I'm asking is because B2B sales sound really scary uh, to me. I have, I have mm -hmm. never, I mean, I have kind of done it, but it still sounds, uh, because I have tried to sell to restaurants before, uh, but it still mm -hmm. kind of sounds scary because it's like there's a, a long chain of things that you have to go to do, like uh, many people that you have to go through. And uh, there's always a question is, you know, does this person actually care? Because, for example, let's say you go to a company and you talk to the, you know, to some kind, to let's say marketing manager, right? But the marketing manager is not the owner of the company, and even the GM, even like CEO, is not the owner of the company. So, does he actually care about making things better, or he doesn't want to make things more difficult for him, and that's why he's just gonna say no? So it's like because you're not getting exactly. directly to the owner. So you know, the question is. Yeah, that's why it's, it's a, it's a, it was always complicated, kind of, in my mind. 100%. Exactly. So I think in B2B sales, uh, that's a very important point. There is uh, the difference between uh, B2C is that in B2B, instead of one, you have at least three personas. And yeah. each of them can be several people. You have the user that who actually going to use the product. Most of the time, if it's, uh, if it's not a small and medium company and like a startup, the user and the decision maker would be someone different. Uh, decision maker would be usually like the CEO or CFO. And then there would be a buyer, like, or it can be the manager, let's say, for those users. Let's say you are targeting design uh, teams in companies. Then the designer and PM would be the user. The head of design or head of product would be the decision maker. Okay, we need this. And the buyer would be CEO or CFO. So, okay, like that makes sense. We can actually spend money on it, for example. And it's very important you talk to the right person. And finding it, it's uh, quite challenging. So that's why you, you already need to have a good idea about your product, who you are selling it to, and also about the company. Okay, in this company, who is the decision maker and the buyer? then you reach out to them uh, either directly or indirectly. I'm not saying like directly go to them, like, uh, but know that it's the head of design that's going to make the, make the call, not the head of product in this company. Mm. In another company, it might be the CPO who makes the de uh, decision, not the head of design is like nothing. So absolutely. And that is very, very hard. And we also experience problems with that. Uh, like it's very hard to know who is the decision maker. And the last uh, part about B2B probably, you know, is that it's still based on trust. Like even if you write, find the right person and all of that, uh, it comes back to 
like, do I really like you? And uh, do I want to work with you? And I trust you enough that I want to use your product. Uh, even like you write everything legally and like, this is what you're going to do. If this happens, that will happen. But all of that is just uh, in case. Still, the person needs to believe that, okay, I want to work with you, Farid, and your company, mm. and it's I like it. Uh, that is what uh, matters in the end. It's not like they can be, uh, yeah. So it's more edge to edge, uh, kind of in cliche they say, yeah. like human to human than B two B, the B two B sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I'm still, I'm still scared of it, but it's something that you know you have to do. If you have to do it, then you have to do it. You just have to go through that. Exactly. And do it. What about you? Like, um, so your your new company, uh, it's in cybersecurity, as far as I understand. And is it also B two B? Yes. And uh, have you thought of like how you're going to do sales? Like, uh, are you scared of that process, or you have some kind of plan, or you have not thought about that yet? Uh, I'm in the research process for that um, to understand. Now I'm actually in the segmentation because, for example, just like mm-hmm. your startup, I can sell it for a variety of different type of companies, like small startups, yeah. agencies, like enterprises, and each of them has very different features. So before you know, I know the sales process and sales cycle, it's very much important to know who I am selling to. If I end up focusing on startups, like less than 50 people, uh, or like mobile apps, that would be a very different sales process than if I focus on enterprises. Since we are mm. still in a, as I said, very early stage, uh, so we are just uh, evaluating each option and see mm. in which one the problem is the biggest. And after that, it's always like, yeah, we are still in the problem validation stage. After that, it comes, okay, let's say enterprises, who is the decision maker for this product in the enterprises, these personas, and then try to reach to them mm. uh, with cold outreach and to start with. Yeah. Again, research, research and research. <laughs> exactly. You know, so I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, where are you right now? Because you're in Sweden, right? Exactly. And uh, how is it? How is it like in Sweden? Do you like it? You know, is it a good place for a startup? Because, like, I also remember that, you know, when there was COVID, uh, most countries were closed except Sweden. Sweden was like, no, we're just going to keep everything open and so on. So how is it in general? Do you like living there or? I love it. I say it's one of the best countries I've ever been. And especially from the business standpoint, there are, it's very good for many different reasons. If you are in tech, uh, there is a lot of opportunities here, both like as a developer, engineer, designer, a lot of startups happening, a lot of capital in the market. Uh, very big, successful companies has been here historically, like starting from Skype and then uh, Klarna, Spotify, Zettel, which uh, got acquired by PayPal, and mm-hmm. many more startups, uh, like big, big startups, uh, as big as Spotify and Klarna. That makes and these founders and like employees get uh, of course when they're exiting or ipo and get a lot of money so they come and either start a new company and invest in those companies so it's like a snowball effect uh, the ecosystem is very dynamic for the last couple of years uh, there is the talent is quite good that you can find very highly skilled people uh, working mm. with different things. There are some themes that are very popular here, like sharing economy is very big here. Uh, anything about green uh, technologies, uh, green investments is super big here. And there are, and fintech as well, like uh, there are so many fintech companies mm-hmm. coming out of Stockholm uh, or uh, generally in Sweden that are built on top of the knowledge from other companies. So I think it's a very dynamic and a uh, great place to be. It also on the, apart from business side and the social side, 
it has a good welfare system, very good mm. uh, public transportation system and uh, network, very good uh, social security in a sense that for if you are, for example, losing a job or something happens, there is very good support about that. Uh, it is, a, to some extent, like perfect place to, to be in, in, innovative and make uh, new companies. And actually, the number of unicorns, I, I haven't checked it for last year, but up to like two years ago, uh, or like up to the latest data, Stockholm is the, or Sweden is the second place after Silicon Valley with the number of unicorns per capita. So really? it, there is a lot of uh, like unicorns and like just mm-hmm. uh, innovation in the country. And there is a lot of reasons why that's happening. And that's very exciting to be here. Wow. I mean, I know that Sweden is considered, you know, one of the, you know, uh, best co- countries to live in terms of life, life quality and so on. So I know that, you know, it's in the top charts uh, from like, according to any statistics. Uh, but I also know that, you know, the income tax there is like 60% or something like that. It's, it's, it's very high, right? The uh, income tax. Have uh, you thought about that? Like, so first, I think income tax is 30%. Really? Maybe like if you put them all together, uh, depends on how you're uh, calculating and which point of view. Mm-hmm. That is different taxes comes back to back. But it's, but, it's rising. The more you earn, uh, the higher is the income tax, I think. No? Yeah, exactly. Uh, but after a certain point, for example, it becomes yeah, 50%, for example. But you get the benefits in so many ways that it's, it's worth doing it. And there Mm. is a lot of opportunities basically to, yeah, like you wouldn't get rich with your income or like with your salary. Uh, So it's not like for example in US or somewhere else, maybe you would be like that. So Sweden is more like you will get a really good salary to just have a really nice life and buy everything you want and do all the trips and all of that. But for if you want, like if your goal is to get rich and everything, then you definitely need to uh, either go really big on investments, which a lot of people are doing uh, investments in stock markets here Mm -hmm. and funds, or uh, start a company or business or be a consultant, which is also Mm -hmm. uh, done by a lot of uh, Mm -hmm. people. Then the taxes and everything becomes very favorable towards you. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So it... The income tax is not something that concerns you, right? The fact that it can go no. up to 50%. It, okay. Yeah, it, exactly. Uh, I mean, because that is not the main uh, source of uh, basically revenue for, for future. You just basically earn money to just live a good life. And the standards uh, are quite high, both like on the level of salaries. So mm-hmm. in the end, you end up getting a really good salary end of the month. So, But what do you mean when you say that's not the main you know, in uh, re- revenue stream. Do you mean like, for example, if your company, let's say, you know, makes a uh, lot of money and then you get uh, a part of it as dividends, it's not counted as income tax. So it's not like 50% tax for that or... Um, no, it's not 50%, that? then it's more like 30%. Okay, so when you get... So yeah, then the income salary is... Fi- or salary 22% can be 50%. actually. Exactly. Oh, so the salary so at 50%. Is- but dividends is at uh, an Azam. Oh, okay. Exactly. Okay. I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure about this, but it's something between 20 to 30%, something like that. I can uh, check it okay. afterwards. Yeah, but... that's, that's, that's not too bad. Yeah. The, yeah. the reason why I'm asking is because, for example, uh, right now where I am in Azerbaijan, I pay, well, I pay a funny number of, I, I pay like 5%. So <laughs> it's even, it's funny to mention, but obviously uh, we don't have all the benefits like of the security, you know, uh, all, all the security benefits that uh, we ha- people have in Sweden. So that's, that's without, a qu- that's without questions. Uh, I would actually prefer to pay more, but to have a more secure and like a better life, I would say, you know, and uh, so I, I, I would do that, but uh, it's just a difficult thing to adjust to after paying a very low percentage and then paying a higher percentage, it's uh, just a difficult thing mentally to uh, get used mm-hmm. to. 
<laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, good. So, is there anything else that uh, you want to talk about? No, I think, uh, thank you so much this? for, yeah, thank you so much for all the questions and uh, great talk. I also learned a lot from you and uh, basically what you are doing at BIP. Um, very yeah, nice I mean, thank you. You like, actually, you know, uh, you talked about many interesting concepts, you know, the steps on how to do things properly, because many people just do things, you know, just anyhow, they just do it the way they do it. They don't follow any process. They don't do research and so on. So I think, you know, many people after listening to this, they will actually think about it. Maybe they should do research. Maybe they should do MVTs and uh, and all the other uh, things that you, yeah. you should do if you want to increase your chances to uh, get successful with your product and so on. So I think it was very informative and really cool. And um, Thank you. Happy to hear So let's, uh, let's actually also share, um, what is your Twitter handle? So my Twitter is, handle is uh, T H E Hamed M P T H E H A M E D Z Hamed M P. Okay, so exactly. that's okay. That's cool. Uh, just for people to know, minus uh, hustle underscore Fred, and uh, yeah, again, nice to meet you. Just don't close the tab yet. I will just stop the video. Okay. 